Good morning. This PowerPoint covers the next portion of our unit on solutions. It first will provide a review of the material learned in class, which was dealing with the composition of the solutions, the factors that affect the rate of dissolving, and the types of solutions that can be formed based on polarities. The next portion of the unit covering colligative properties will be found on a second PowerPoint presentation. By the time that you are done watching this PowerPoint, you should be able to do the following. Compare the effects of temperature and pressure on solubility, explain solution equilibrium and distinguish among saturated, unsaturated and supersaturated solutions, explain the meaning of like dissolves like in terms of polar versus nonpolar substances, given the mass of a solute and the volume of a solvent, calculate the concentration of a solution, Given the concentration of a solution, determine the amount of solute in a given amount of solution. And finally, given the concentration of a solution, determine the amount of solution that contains a given amount of solute. The first thing that we're going to look at are the parts of a solution. Please remember that you have two parts, the solute and the solvent. So the solute is the substance that gets dissolved the solvent is the substance that is doing the dissolving. The solute and the solvent, when they are in the same state of matter, will not have any appearance of change in the state, but the substance that is found in the greatest amount will be your solvent. So again, if I have 100 grams of water mixing with 200 grams of ethyl alcohol, the ethyl alcohol will be the solvent and the water will be the solute. When these substances are found in different states of matter, whichever substance stays the same as the state of matter for the mixture, that is your solvent, no matter how much of each is present. The solute will always seem to disappear or take on the state of the solvent. Aqueous solutions are specifically when water is your solvent, and water again is often called the universal solvent. Please remember, when we're dealing with the mathematical calculations, the solution mass is equal to the mass of the solute plus the mass of the solvent. Next, we are going to discuss solubility. When one substance is able to dissolve in another, it is said to be soluble. Please remember when we discuss this term in class, if the solution is made up of substances in the same state, we call those substances miscible when they dissolve in one another. Salt is soluble in water. Again, salt being a solid, water being a liquid, the solution that is created would be termed as soluble. Bromine is soluble in methylene chloride. Bromine is a liquid at room temperature. Methylene chloride is also a liquid. So again, we would describe this as being miscible. When one substance does not dissolve in another, they are said to be insoluble. So again, different states of matter, insoluble, the term that we use when they are of the same state is immiscible. So oil and water would be immiscible because they do not dissolve in one another. Usually we have a limit to just how soluble one substance is in another. Those limits are based off of the interactions between the solute and the solvent. Typically, there has to be room for the solute particles to fit in between the solvent molecules. Gases are always going to be soluble in each other. And as we said, some liquids are going to be mutually soluble. Their amounts will not be limited if they are soluble and they are liquids. The next piece that we will review is the factors that affect the rate of dissolution. Please remember dissolution is another term for dissolving. You'll see dissolving, solvation, hydration, 
just depending on the particular type of process that is taking place. Because the dissolution process occurs at the surface of the solute, it can be speeded up if the surface area of the solute is increased. So increasing the surface area, we have more contact that's occurring between the solute and the solvent. Stirring is the second method that we can use to increase the rate of dissolving. The stirring or shaking will again increase the amount of contact between the solvent and the solute surface. This will allow fresh solvent molecules that have not dissolved solute to come in contact with the solute particles at the surface. And by continuing that stirring process, you will speed up the rate at which they will dissolve. The last thing, which is higher temperatures, you will again be increasing the number of collisions between the solvent molecules and the solute molecules. This will allow, again, the solvent molecules and the sol solute molecules to overcome those forces of attraction that are holding them together and allow them to come in contact more often. And as a result, with those collisions being more frequent and in higher energy, they'll be able to speed up the collision process. Please remember, the only one that will actually affect the amount of substance that will dissolve is the temperature. As mentioned in the last slide, the temperature will actually affect the overall amount of the substance that will dissolve in solution. For most solids, as the temperature increases, the solubility will increase as well, but that's not always the case. As you can see with the sodium chloride, there's virtually no change in the solubility of sodium chloride. You have substances like cerium sulfate down here at the very bottom, where an increase in the temperature will actually cause the solubility of that substance to decrease. And then you finally have things like the potassium nitrate here, where you will see a rapid increase in the solubility of the substance as the temperature increases. When we talk about gases, for gases, you generally will see a decrease in the solubility as the temperature increases. Please remember from what we talked about in class the other day, the reason for this is again, by having a higher energy, the particles will be able to escape the surface of the liquid and will not be bound by those particles at the surface trying to hold them back in the solution. The last part of review from Thursday's class is describing solutions qualitatively. If you recall, we talked about a concentrated solution having a high proportion of solute to solvent molecules. When we talked about that term concentrated, please remember there's not a finite amount that always classifies a substance as being concentrated or dilute. This is just based on a relative amount. When we talk about having a dilute solution, we typically have a low proportion of the solute compared to the solvent molecules making up the solution. We are now going to describe the solution's concentration based on the amount of solute that has been dissolved. To begin with, we need to describe what a solution equilibrium is. A solution equilibrium is the physical state in which the opposing processes of dissolution or dissolving and crystallization of a solute occur at the same rate. The key thing with any equilibrium is the fact that it appears as if no change is occurring. Because I have just as many particles of the solute that are dissolving as I have dissolved particles crystallizing out from the solution, it will appear as if nothing occurs. During the dissolving process, when we have a saturated solution that will contain the maximum amount of particles of the solute that will dissolve in a given solvent at a specific temperature. Typically, it's going to be 100 grams of the solvent that is given. When we have an unsaturated solution, you're going to have less solute that has been dissolved in that solvent at a specific temperature. The key thing here with the unsaturated solution is it can still dissolve more. And finally, we have 
a super saturated solution. And this one seems a little bit counterintuitive, but a super saturated solution is going to be one that contains more solute that can dissolve in a given amount of solvent at a specific temperature. The way how we create that super saturated solution is we have to heat the solvent. And as you saw on the last slide, for most solutes, their solubility will increase with a increase in temperature. So by heating the solvent, we're allowing more of that substance to dissolve, and then we let it cool back down. And as long as it stays undisturbed, it will stay dissolved in the solution. Once it is disturbed, it will begin to precipitate and crash out is what we call it. We can have the solutions crash out by either stirring, scraping the sides of the container with a glass stirring rod to shave off little tiny particles of the glass for which the surface area is now there to begin crystallization, or we can add what's called a seed crystal, which is just another solid grain of whichever solute we happen to have. You'll notice two different diagrams here. The first one, which is dealing with the mass of the solute that's added versus the mass of the solute that is dissolved. When it is unsaturated, you are still able to dissolve more substance and you will not see any crystallization taking place. So you would see a solution that is completely dissolved. When we talk about a saturated solution, if it has reached the saturated amount and there is no other solute that's added, you will not see any precipitation taking place. However, as soon as we have tried to add more than that saturated amount, then we will begin to see the solid remaining undissolved in the bottom of the container. Just think about if you go to a restaurant and you order unsweet tea, and then you try to add sugar after it's been poured over ice. Not a lot of the sugar will dissolve at the cold temperature, and so you get a layer of sugar that's at the bottom. When we look at the diagram on the right, this shows you a super saturated solution of sodium acetate. When we look at the sodium acetate solution, you can see here on the side that the solubility of the sodium acetate is 46.4 grams for every 100 milliliters of water. So at this point, we have heated up the solution to a temperature greater than 20 degrees, which will allow us to dissolve more of the sodium acetate. We have let the solution cool down in the second picture, and then we've added a seed crystal. You can begin to see the needle-like crystals of the sodium acetate appearing as the solution begins to crystallize. And then finally, you can see the solution over time where it is almost completely precipitated and dissolved the or uh, crashed out of the solution i should say uh, this is the basic reaction that takes place in a lot of the uh, heat warmer packs that you can buy that are reusable you'll have a little metal disc inside that you can manipulate and when that manipulation occurs it disturbs the solution enough to cause the solution to crash out and form the solid. As it does that, because it took energy into the solution to make the substance dissolved, again, heating up the mixture, it stores that energy in the solution. And then when it solidifies and it has that phase change, kind of thinking back to what we did with our last unit on thermodynamics, when that phase change occurs and it solidifies, Remember, that is an exothermic process, and it will constantly release the heat. So that's how those hand warmers end up working. When you want to reuse them, you simply stick them into some boiling water, and again, use the energy of the boiling water to dissolve the sodium acetate at a higher temperature once more, and then it will be ready for use the next time. We can use what's called a solubility curve to show the saturated or maximum amount of solute that can dissolve in a given amount of solvent at a given temperature. You'll notice with the lines, look at your x-axis over here and your y-axis. We have temperature on the x. We have the amount of solvent particles, in this case water, on the y-axis. So for every 100 grams of water, we can then look at these amounts of the different substances that are listed out with each individual line. And that will tell you what the maximum amount of the solute 
that will dissolve at a specific temperature in 100 grams of water. When we look at these, just a couple of key things. Number one, you can compare the solubilities of different substances based on the same temperature and you can do that just by simply comparing where the line is in comparison to the other. So for example, if I looked at rubidium chloride versus lithium chloride, and I wanted to see which one was more soluble at 60 degrees, I would come over here to the 60 degrees, I would come up and I could look at the two lines. The rubidium chloride has a solubility of approximately 115. The lithium chloride has a solubility somewhere approximately around 96 or 97. So at that temperature, the rubidium chloride would therefore be the more soluble substance. We could also determine whether or not a substance is a saturated, unsaturated, or a supersaturated solution depending on how many grams at a specific temperature have been dissolved. So for an example of that, if we look at the ammonium chloride, and we said that if we look at, say, 50 degrees Celsius, at 50 degrees Celsius, we'd say that 60 grams have been dissolved. You can look here at 50, come across, the solubility for the saturated solution would equal 50 grams. So since we have 60 grams dissolved, we know that we have a supersaturated solution. So if the amount that's dissolved for a specific substance is greater than what is dissolved along the line. So again, the line represents the saturated solution. If it's found to be above the line, then that means that we have a supersaturated solution. If it's below the line, then that means that we can still dissolve more at that particular temperature to make it saturated. So in that case, it would be an unsaturated solution. So for that same example, if we're looking at 50 degrees for the NH4Cl, say now we only had 25 grams. So in that case, we could take, in this particular instance, we could add an additional 25 grams of the solute and still have it dissolve in order to make the saturated solution. Okay, so let's now take a quick moment to make sure that you understand this concept. So for this first question, how does the solubility of KCl at 80 degrees Celsius compare with that of sodium chloride at the same temperature? So please take a moment and try to answer that question. So as we look at our graph over here, you have your two lines that we need to identify, KCl and NaCl, and we're looking at 80 degrees. So I want to come over here. Here is my solubility for sodium chloride at 80. Here is my solubility of potassium chloride at 80. You'll notice again, the solubility is somewhere just slightly below 40, so maybe 38 for the sodium chloride. For the potassium chloride, it's somewhere a little bit above 50, so maybe 52. So in this case, the correct answer should be B, KCl is more soluble than the NaCl at 80 degrees. So we are now going to begin to learn how to perform the calculations mathematically involving concentrations. There are four main types of calculations that we're going to take care of during this unit. The first one, calculating mass percent or volume percentage works the same way. The mass or the volume percent will be equal to the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution or the volume of the solute divided by the volume of the solution times 100%. At the beginning of this PowerPoint, you hopefully recall that to determine the mass of the solution, you simply take the grams of the solute and add the grams of the solvent and then divide the grams of the solute by that mass of the solution and multiply it by 100%.
We are going to begin our first example problem for percent by mass by trying to determine the concentration of glucose in a solution made by dissolving 5.5 grams of glucose in 78.2 grams of water. So in this particular instance, please remember we would take the 5.5 grams of glucose, C6H12O6, and we're going to divide it by the mass of the solution, which would be the 5.5 grams for the glucose plus the 78.2 grams of the water. And then we're going to multiply that times 100%. And when you do the math on this, it should come out to be approximately 6.6%. The next type of concentration that we're going to learn how to calculate is molarity. Molarity, which is symbolized as a capital M, equals the number of moles of solute per, uh, per liter of solution. When we describe the molarities, this is the most important form of concentration that you're going to use in chemistry. So just as an example, we would say for this solution of HCl, when we dissolve six moles of HCl in two liters of solution, that would equal a three molar solution. So again, the term that we would use would be a molar solution and the capital M stands for moles per liter. So when we're doing the dimensional analysis, you can treat this just like any other type of conversion, whether it's a molar mass, whether it's using Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles per mole, or the volume of a gas, 22.4 liters per mole. The solutions molarity can be for either solids, liquids, or gases. We're now going to look at our first molarity calculation. In this example problem, you have one mole of sugar that is being dissolved in 125.0 milliliters of solution. So in order to calculate the molarity, by definition, the volume must be in liters. So we're going to start by taking the 125.0 milliliters of the solution and converting that into liters. There's 1,000 milliliters for every one liter. So that will give me 0 0.1250 liters of the solution. So I will now take the one mole of the sugar and divide that by the 0 0.1250 liters of the solution and that will give us a molarity of 8.00. Since the 1.00 has three significant figures, my molarity will have three significant figures. The next example that we're going to look at is still going to calculate the molarity of a solution, but we're going to step it up in difficulty just a little bit by instead of giving you a straight amount of moles, we're going to make you solve for them first from the grams. So in this example, we have 500.0 grams of potassium phosphate, K3PO4, and we need to convert that amount into moles. The molar mass for potassium phosphate, K3PO4, is 212.27 grams. When we multiply this out, that will give us 2.355 moles. And it tells us that we have 1.5 liters of solution. So I can take my number of moles of the K3PO4 and I can divide that by the 1.50 liters and the concentration will be 1.57 molar at the end. Okay, so we're going to try to test your ability to work on these problems. So please pause the recording for just a moment. You can do that in the upper right hand corner and try to work out this problem. It says consider separating solutions of separate solutions of NaOH and KCl made by dissolving 100 grams of each solute in 250 milliliters of solution. Which solution will have the greater molarity? Explain. Okay, so this one is kind of conceptual as well as mathematical. 
we can do this one of two different ways. We can look at the molar masses, since I have 100 grams of each substance and they're dissolved in the same amount of solution. We know that the molar mass for sodium hydroxide is 40 grams per mole. And for KCl, we have 74.55 grams per mole. So I know having 100 grams of each solute, I should have a larger amount of moles dissolved in the same amount of volume for NaOH that I do compared to the KCl. But let's prove it mathematically as well, just to make sure that we understand. So if I take 100 grams of the NaOH solution and I take the molar mass, one mole, 40.00, again, coming off your periodic table for these molar masses, that should give me 2.50 moles of NaOH. So now when I take that and I divide that by 0 0.250 liters, again, 250 converted into liters, that should give me a molarity of 10.0 molar for the NaOH. When I take the 100 grams of the KCl, one mole of the KCl, 74.55, And the number of moles of KCl should be 1.34. We can take that and divide it by the 0 0.250 for the liters, and that will give us 5.37 molar. So that again is KCl and a OH. So you can see both mathematically we proved it that the sodium hydroxide will have the greater concentration and we can do it conceptually knowing that we have the smaller molar mass and the same beginning amount of grams that I should have the larger concentration because I'd have more moles of the NaOH. Okay so for the second concept check you have two solutions of hydrochloric acid HCl they are labeled solution A and solution B. It is told that solution A has a greater concentration than solution B. Which of the following statements is true? So if you have equal volumes of both solution, solution B must contain more moles of HCl. When we look at this one, again, it tells us that the solution A has a greater concentration. So if they have equal volumes, solution A would have to have more moles than solution B. So, so answer choice A is incorrect. If we look at B, if you have equal moles of HCl in both solutions, solution B must have a greater volume. So when we look at that, having the same number of moles, if solution A has to have a greater concentration, that means that the moles would have to be divided by a smaller amount for A than it would for B. So B would be true. When we look at C, to, ob to obtain equal concentrations of both solutions, you must add a certain amount of water to solution B. Again, same thing, solution A is more concentrated, so in order to dilute it down to that same concentration as B, we'd have to add water to A instead. So C would be incorrect. And then finally, to make both solutions less concentrated, you must add more moles of HCl. In order to add, or in order to make a substance less concentrated, more solvent is required, not more solute. So D would be incorrect as well. So we have a special case scenario that occurs when the solute that is being dissolved is an ionic compound. If you recall from class on Thursday, we discussed dissociation, where an ionic compound will dissociate into its ions when it is dissolved in water. So we put water over the arrow, and we would have two sets of aqueous ions that would get produced. But notice from our chemical formula, as that solid CaCl2 is dissolved, I would get one ion of calcium, but I would get two chloride ions that would form as well. So when we're talking about the concentration of the individual ions, 
you can simply multiply the concentration of the solution by whatever the coefficient is for that particular ion. So in this case example, because calcium has only one mole of calcium ions per mole of the calcium chloride, again, just a stoichiometry concept, it would have a concentration of 0.25 molar Ca2+. For the chloride ion, because there are two moles, because of the coefficient of two, I have two moles of chloride ions for every one mole of the calcium chloride. I can effectively multiply the concentration of the calcium chloride by two to have it equal the concentration of the Cl minus. So if we looked at one more quick example with this, if we go and look at say sodium arsenate, Na3ASO4 as a solid that would dissolve into three Na plus and one ASO4 three minus. So if I started off with a 0 0.40 molar Na3ASO4 solution, I would have three times the 0.4, which would equal 1.20 molar Na plus, and I'd have one times the 0.4 or a 0 0.40 molar arsenate ion in solution. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick concept check for the concentration of your ions. All you have to do to determine which solution contains the highest number of ions is to remember that the highest number of ions is gonna represent the highest number of moles. So when I look at my first choice here, 400 milliliters of a 0.1 molar NaCl solution, again, I would have 400 times 0.1 for the molarity. So I would have 0.4 liters and I can multiply that times the 0.1 molar. So that would give me 0 0.04 moles of NaCl. I have one ion each, one sodium, one chloride ion. So I can multiply that by two. So that would give me 0 0.08 moles of ions for the NaCl. When I look at my second example, I can take the 0 0.30 liters multiply that times the molarity, which is 0 0.10 molar once again, and that will give me 0 0.03 moles of the CaCl2. But in this case, I have one mole of calcium ions plus two moles of chloride ions, so I can multiply this amount by three, which would give me 0 0.09 moles instead. When I look at my next example, I can take 0 0.200 liters, for the iron three chloride solution, multiply that times the 0 0.10 molar, and that will give me 0 0.02 moles. You'll notice here I have one plus three, one mole of iron, three moles of chloride ions. So I can multiply this times four, which would also equal 0 0.08 moles of your ions. Finally, for our last one, most people will think with this that we would have the largest amount because I have the largest volume of the same percentage. But notice sucrose, that compound is covalent, so it would have zero ions. So your correct answer should be B. We're going to now look at a special application of molarity, which is called molarity by dilution. Oftentimes in lab, we will start off with a concentrated or a stock solution, one that has a known value, and we dilute it down to produce a concentration that we want to use for a particular experiment. Typically with the dilution problems, we are dealing with water as our solvent. And so as we add more water, we're not changing the number of moles of solute that are present inside. And so the number of moles both before and after the dilution are equivalent. So just to kind of illustrate this, pardon my artwork again, uh, we're going to start off here. Let's just say that we have 100 grams of water, so that would equal 100 milliliters for the water. And let's add to that 50 grams of NaCl. So to start off, take the 50 grams of NaCl, 
and we're going to convert it into moles. So one mole of the NaCl, 58.44 grams. And if you plug that into your calculator really quickly, you should get somewhere around 0.855 moles. We're going to assume that the volume is not going to change in this case, where we have 100 milliliters of the solution, and we would end up with 0 0.100 liters. So I'd have a molarity equal to 8.55 molar for the solution. Now, let's say to this, we add an additional 200 grams of water. So now, that would bring the total volume of my solution up to 300. When we're working this problem, like I said previously, the number of grams of NaCl didn't change. All we did was add more water to that beaker. So I could then take that same number of moles and I could divide it by 300 milliliters now instead And that would equal 2.85 for the molarity. Now, because the number of moles are the same, if you remember that the molarity equals moles per liter, if I want to get the number of moles by itself, I could multiply both sides by the number of liters. That would cancel, and I would now have molarity times volume. This is where this equation comes into play because the molarity of the first one times the volume of the first solution will equal the moles of that first solution. And the molarity of the second times the volume of the second will equal the moles of the second. But again, the number of moles are the same as well. So I can just set M1V1 equals M2V2 equal to each other and that's our overall equation to solve for molarity by dilution. So if we look at this same problem, using that M1V1 equals M2V2 format, I could take the 8.55 for the molarity, multiply it by the 0 0.100 liters, and that's going to equal M2 times 0.3 liters. And I can divide both sides by 0.3, and you come up with 2.85 for the molarity. The one thing with these problems, just want to stress, because the equation has both a volume for the initial set and for the final, you're able to use units other than liters. So you can use milliliters if you wanted to and just say 0.55 molar times 100 milliliters equals M2 times 300 milliliters, the volume units will cancel each other out. So whether it's in liters or milliliters will be irrelevant. So let's now look at an example for molarity by dilution. What is the minimum volume of a 2.00 molar NaOH solution needed to make 150 milliliters of a 0.8 molar NaOH solution? So as we begin this problem, again, I have an initial molarity 2.00 molar and I'm going to multiply that times some volume and that will equal 0 0.800 molar times 150 milliliters of solution. So I can now take this, divide each side by 2.00 molar and I can now solve for V1. So 8.8 .8 divided by 2 would be 0 0.4. 0 0.4 times 150 should equal 60 milliliters of the initial stock solution. So now we are going to begin looking at problems involving stoichiometry where we have a molarity given as part of the problem. So just like before, Treat these problems the same way. Try to get whatever your given information is into moles, and then you're able to convert from one substance to another through that balanced chemical equation. If you have reactions involving ions, especially where a precipitate is forming, typically it is easier to write them out as the net ionic equation first, 
and then go ahead and solve. But you want to calculate your moles of your reactants, determine which substance, when necessary, is your limiting and which is your excess, and then calculate the moles of the other reactants or products as required. Your final answer could be in grams, it could be in liters, it could be in particles, just like we've done for every other type of stoichiometry problem. Okay, so let's begin to look at our first practice problem for stoichiometry for solutions. So the first thing that we want to do is write out our balanced equation. So I'm going to set this problem up using a rice table, just like we've done in the past. So I'm going to have Na3PO4. And again, these are always aqueous here to begin with because we have a solution reacting with lead to nitrate. So I'm going to give myself plenty of space to be able to write information out. So I've got both of these being aqueous. I'm going to form the product, which would be PB3. Sorry, hang on. And then PO4 parentheses 2. That's my solid. And then I would have NaNO3. So when we balance the equation, I need 3 for the lead to nitrates. I need 2 for the sodium phosphates. And I would have a 6 for my coefficient for the sodium nitrate. Again, the sodium nitrate, always soluble, so it will be aqueous. So now I need to get my initial molarities into moles. This hopefully you notice because I have one, two different starting amounts for my reactants. This is a limiting reactant problem. So when I look at the PB3PO4 parentheses 2, that will be forming as my precipitate. It's asking us for what mass of that precipitate will form. So I'm going to first off multiply each of my amounts here. I have for my rice table. I have 0 0.30 molar. My volume, in this case, I must use the liters. So I'd have 0 0.010 liters. And so that would give me an initial number of moles of 0 0.003 for the sodium phosphate. For the lead 2 nitrate, I have 20 milliliters, and it is a 0.2 molar solution. So I take the 0.2 moles, 0.2 molar, multiply it by the 0 0.020 liters, and that will give me 0 0.004 for my moles of the lead to nitrate. You'll notice with our coefficients for our change, this would be minus 2x, this would be minus 3x. So when I set these equal to zero to determine my limiting, my x for the first one would be 0 0.0015 moles. When I look at my second one, 0 0.0040, now we're dividing by three instead. So I know that my x would equal 0 0.00133 for my moles of the lead to nitrate. So in this case, my limiting reactant, smaller amount, would be the lead to nitrate. When I come over here, I only have a plus x, so I know that I would have 0 0.00133 for my number of moles of the lead to phosphate. And the molar mass, if we calculate this up to get into grams, we can multiply that times 811.54 grams per mole. And so I would end up with approximately 1.1 grams of the PB2, I'm sorry, PB3, excuse me, PO4 parentheses 2. So I'd have 1.1 grams approximately at the end. So we're now going to look at a part B for this first question. 
we're using the same exact reaction, sodium phosphate reacting with lead 2 nitrate to produce lead 2 phosphate and sodium nitrate. But in this case, we're going to focus on the concentration of the excess ion that remains in solution. So the first thing that we need to consider here, again, getting our balance equation back up onto the board, we need to determine, based on those starting amounts, how much of the excess ion we have present in the solution. So we had 2 Na3PO4, we had 3 PbNO3 parentheses 2, and that was again forming the Pb3PO4 parentheses 2 as a solid plus the 6 Na NO3. So like we had talked about at the start, we had our initial amount of the lead 2 nitrate, which was 20 milliliters of 0 0.20 molar. So we had an initial amount of 0 0.004 moles. So now again, here we have to think about our concept of dissociation. I know that for the PbNO3 parentheses 2, when that is dissolved in water, that formed Pb2 plus and 2 NO3 minus. So if I started with 0 0.004 moles of the PbNO3 parentheses 2, based on my stoichiometry of my coefficients, having a coefficient of 2, I know that I would have 0 0.008 moles of the solution. Now, here's the one thing. Notice that we're mixing 10 milliliters with 20 milliliters of those two solutions. So now my new volume would be 30 milliliters, 10 plus 20 milliliters for a total of 30 milliliters. So to determine the concentration of the nitrate ions, and we can abbreviate the concentration of by simply placing the substance in brackets. That bracket means concentration of in terms of molarity. So the concentration of the nitrate ion would be the 0 0.008 moles divided by 0 0.030 liters. And when we do that, we'd have a concentration equal to 0.27 molar for that reaction. We are now going to look at our third method of measuring concentrations, which is molality. Unfortunately, molality is very close to molarity. It is symbolized as a lowercase m rather than as an uppercase m. It stands for the number of moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. This is going to be an important concentration unit when we get to our next portion of the unit dealing with colligative properties. But the big difference here I want you to notice is it is kilograms of the solvent, not the solution. So that's where we have our slight difference. So your molalities will always be slightly larger than your molarities because it's dealing with just the solvent and not adding in the additional mass of the solute, which would make the denominator a little bit larger for the molarities. With your molalities, again, you're, cal you're calculating it the same exact way. The only thing that's different, you don't have to actually know the chemical formula for the solvent because you just need it in kilograms. So as long as you have the actual number of grams or some type of mass for it, you can solve any of these problems. Okay, so now let's look at a molality practice problem. The first problem that we have here, we are taking a solution made by dissolving 4.35 grams of glucose. Notice in this case, they do give you a formula for the solute because we need to convert it into moles. So we're gonna take the mass of the glucose in 25 milliliters of water at 25 degrees, and we're gonna calculate the molality of that solution. Please notice that they give you the water having a density of one gram per milliliter. 
So since we have 25 milliliters, we know we have 25 grams of water. The water is our solvent in this case, so we would then need to convert it into kilograms. So I'm going to start by converting my number of grams of the glucose into moles. The molar mass for glucose is 180.18. And so that would give us 0 0.0241 moles of glucose. And we're going to now divide that by the kilograms of the solvent. So again, 25 milliliters, 1.00 grams per milliliter would be 25 grams. And we could take that and divide the 1,000 grams for every one kilogram. So we would now take that and divide it by 0 0.025 kilograms. When we divide 0 0.0241 moles by 0 0.025 kilograms, you end up with a 0.966 molal solution of glucose. Notice again the unit is a lowercase m rather than an uppercase. So now let's look at our second problem. We have a molality of a solution made by dissolving 36.5 grams of naphthalene, which is C10H8, in 425 grams of toluene. So same thing, I need to begin the problem by determining my number of moles of the naphthalene. The molar mass for naphthalene should be 128.18 grams. So that will give me 0.6, I'm sorry, 0.284 moles. And we're going to divide that by 0.425 kilograms of the toluene and we come up with a 0 0.670 molal solution of naphthalene. So our fourth concentration method is based off of mole fractions. Mole fractions should hopefully look familiar to you as we did them with Dalton's law of partial pressures, but in the terms of solutions, mole fraction, when we talk about the component, that'll be either the solute or the solvent compared to the total moles of all the components, which would be the moles of the solution. So the component here, that could be your solute or the solvent, depending on what you're asked to solve for. And then for all the components, that is simply your solution. Same type of thing because I'm taking the number of moles of one and I'm dividing by the total moles, those would cancel and we would have a unitless number for the mole fraction. So remember, mole fraction simply is the percent composition in terms of moles. Typically, your mole fraction type of problems are going to be based off of a percent by mass or a percent by volume for a particular substance. So when we look at this first example problem, it's asking us to calculate both the mole fraction of the HCl in the solution and the molality of the HCl in the solution. So let's begin with this. If I have a 36% by mass HCl solution, that means that I would have 36 grams of the HCl in 100 grams of the solution. Now, because of the fact that the solution is the solute plus the solvent, the 100 grams of the solution would be equal to the 36 grams of the HCl plus 64 grams of water. So the very first thing that we need to do is divide by the molar mass of each of those substances. So if I take 36 grams of HCl and I convert that into moles, one mole, 36.46 grams. 
So I would be left with 0.987 moles of HCl. For the water, we have 64 grams of water, and we're going to divide that by the 18.02, one mole H2O, 18.02 grams, and that will give us 3.55. So now, when we want to calculate the mole fraction, x of HCl, we would simply take my number of grams, or sorry, number of moles, excuse me, number of moles of HCl, and we're going to divide it by the total number of moles of the solution. So I'd have the 0.987 for the moles of HCl plus the 3.55 for my moles of H2O. That will give us a total number of moles, 4.538. Okay, so if I take 0.987, divide it by 4.538, that will give us a mole fraction of 0.191 for the HCl. Remember, it is a unitless number, so do not put moles on the end. So now for part B, if we wanted to calculate the molality, it's the same exact concept. I have my number of moles of the HCl that I already have calculated, 0.987. The only thing that would be different here is that now I only have to divide by the kilograms of the solvent. So since I had 64 grams, that would be 0 0.064 kilograms. And if I take 0.987 and divide it by 0 0.064, we end up with 15.4 molal for the HCl solution. All right, so that covers the end of the first PowerPoint. At this point, at the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe solutions as unsaturated, saturated, or supersaturated, be able to determine those amounts based off of the solubility curves, and you should be able to determine concentrations either by mass or volume percents, by molarity, molality, and mole fractions. There are extra practice problems in the folder to help master these concepts on Schoology. They will also have answer keys posted for you so you can check your work. As a reminder, I will be online on Thursdays from 10 to 11 for you guys to ask questions. I'm also available at other times. Just send me a message either on Remind or through email, and I will be happy to get back in touch with you to help you out. Good luck, everyone. Hopefully see you soon.